Laugh movie is finally here after eight years. And was it worth the wait? Let's see. Yo, what's up, gamers? It's me, Kipster MC. And now that the FNAF movie is finally here, I figure I'm gonna do something I don't normally do. Review it. Now, I'm going to start off with talking about the positives and negatives of the film without going into spoilers. And then, after that, I will give a rating and then go in-depth on some of the spoilers and my thoughts on them. Now, in the comments down below, I would also like to know what you guys thought of it, what you like, dislike about the movie, and what you hope to see in a potential sequel or two. And with all that out of the way, let's start with the positives. Now, first off, and this is something that we all knew was going to be a positive about the movie at the moment we found out the Jim Henson Creature Shop was making the animatronics, and that is, the animatronics look amazing. Like, they look like they were just about ripped from the games. It's so good. And it's really good getting to see them make their appearance on the big screen for the first time ever. The fact that they went with actual animatronics for the movie instead of doing CGI or costumes that wouldn't really be convincing as animatronics also helps out too because they move like actual animatronics and because of that it makes them feel a lot more real in a way about as real as haunted animatronics can get. <laughs> And really, the practical effect work as a whole is just so good throughout the entire film. There's very minimal digital effects, too. I, I don't think I noticed any digital effects while watching the entire thing, unless it was, like, lighting-related or something like that. Maybe if I give the movie a rewatch, I might notice something here or there, but it all seemed very practical to me, and it, it looks really good. And the animatronics and practical effects are not the only things that look incredible in the movie, either, because the set design, particularly for or Freddy Fazbear's itself. Mm, so good. So good. The restaurant feels like an actual restaurant that has been closed down for a while, but you could believe that it used to be popular. And we get a clear, like, sense of, like, where everything in the restaurant is, too, and where each room connects to each other. Now, I will say it definitely helps how they constructed a full-size pizzeria for this, which helps make the pizzeria in the movie feel more like an actual pizzeria. And the scale of it, as described by YouTubers like Dalko, is absolutely massive. Like, it seems big in the film already, but based on what's been said, it's even bigger in person. Like, it, it really is impressive. I think that if you're a FNAF fan, you are definitely going to enjoy seeing the animatronics and the pizzeria on screen, especially with how good they look. I think the movie has some really strong sound design, too. Everything sounds good in it, whether that be sound effects for the animatronics, sound effects that are either taken out of or reminiscent of the games, or sound effects for more re regular, everyday stuff. It all definitely sounds like it fits in properly. Even sound effects for less realistic and more supernatural stuff sounds good too. Like, I think they did a good job in the sound department. The music is also pretty solid as well. I especially love the opening credits theme. In fact, in the car right after the movie, I actually listened to that on repeat because it was just that good in my opinion. I will say, while there's not as much horror as I think there should have been, more on that later, I think the moments we do get particularly during one sequence, are pretty solid. And there are, in fact, some kills. And while it's mostly obscured to keep a PG-13 rating, they're still pretty solid. Kind of brutal, too. Like, a couple of those kills, if shown in full detail, could have resulted in a full R rating instead of just PG-13. Like, they, they push it a little bit. Not throughout the whole film, but during some scenes. And one thing that surprised me, too, was the amount of levity in the film. There were definitely some moments of comedy throughout that I personally think worked for it. If it didn't work for other people, though, that's fine. Yep, everyone's got a different sense of humor, after all. But I got some good laughs out of me and other people in the theater I was watching it in. So, I think the comedy works, too. Also, I really like the cast of the film, in particular Josh Hutcherson as Mike Schmidt and uh, Matthew Lillard as Oliverville, who his character is later. I think you already know, though, but I think those two both give great performances. I think Elizabeth Lail as Vanessa and Piper Rubio as Abby are both strong casting choices, too. Although, Vanessa seemed a little bit off at first, but it made more sense later on when more context to her character was given. More on that in the spoiler section. The rest of the cast, I think, was serviceable enough. They did their jobs fine, they did what they needed to do, and it worked. Now, personally, my favorite actor in the film was Matthew Lillard. He absolutely nails it 
in the scenes he's in. It is such a great performance. And finally, as a FNAF fan, okay, just in general, I'm kind of a sucker for f references, fan service, Easter eggs, and cameos, and all that. And boy, does the FNAF movie has that in spades. I had a whole lot of fun pointing out things I recognized and seeing other people react to stuff in the movie as well. It, it was cool seeing all these references and details. Now, admittedly, you're not as likely to get all the references and Easter eggs if you're not big into FNAF, but usually if you're watching a, a FNAF movie, you're gonna be big into FNAF anyway. But, you know, even if you're not into FNAF but still watching the movie anyway, the references and fan service and all that aren't gonna make or break the movie or anything, but they are still really fun to see for fans. And now, on to the negatives. Personally, I didn't really have that many. Honestly, my only really big negative is that I really wish Matthew Lillard got more screen time, because he was my favorite performance in the film, but this is kind of a half spoiler, like I don't get, I'm not going into specific details yet. He doesn't have as much screen time as I would have liked, which is a shame too, because like I said, he's my favorite performance, but I guess there is a positive there because he absolutely steals the scenes he's in, even if they're not many. I will also admit, like I said earlier, there's not as much horror as I thought there would have been, and yeah, we could have, I guess, used a few more horror scenes. It's not too egregious, but I feel like we could have gotten a few more. And something I thought about after watching the film is, it is not very friendly for newcomers. They just kind of expect you to understand the concepts they're throwing at you, and while they don't, like, get fully into the FNAF lore rabbit hole, like, there's no Fazgu, don't worry. There's no, there's no mention of Fazgu, or time-traveling ball pits, or sound illusion discs or anything crazy like that, or like, okay, I probably shouldn't say two more in the non-spoiler section, but at the same time, there are definitely still a few elements from the games that they just kind of mention and then expect you to catch on immediately. I guess the only other negative I have is that I do think the third act could have had a little bit more build up before getting into the big action, but it's still pretty solid third act, all things considered. But yeah, none of these negatives broke the film for me at all. I still thoroughly enjoyed every single moment of it when watching it. And really, these negatives are all things I thought about after finishing watching the film. But yeah, for an overall rating, I'd say that if you're a casual audience member or newcomer to FNAF as a whole, it's probably gonna be like a 7.5 to 8 for you. And if you're more of a dedicated FNAF fan, it's gonna be probably like a 9 out of 10 for you in terms of your overall experience. And it is possible when you watch the film, your own opinion could end up being different, could be higher or lower, and that's okay too. I'm just like saying what's gonna be more likely the case. And for me personally, I'd say that my enjoyment of it was a 10 out of 10, even if I am willing to admit that there are some flaws I think could definitely have been improved upon. Which, hey, maybe they could fix those flaws in the sequel, since at this point we, we know it's gonna get at least a second film and probably a third film as well. It's pretty much as inevitable as William Afton coming back in a new piece of FNAF media. He always comes back. And also, my best friend Mike and Mike, or Michael, who appears on my channel frequently, recorded his own review of the movie as well. A little short bit to include in here since we couldn't record the review together. And here it is. Hey, what's up guys? It's your boy Mikey Mike, and here's my short review for the new Five Nights at Freddy's movie. And it was good. I loved every second of it. I did the animatronics stay the same design from the original games. I did like they introduced Vanessa, since in the game she wasn't introduced until, uh, I think it was either Help Wanted or Security Breach. <laughs> yeah, it was probably a Security Breach. So yeah, in into the first game. And of course, I loved the uh, Easter egg, like the original poster from the first game. We It captured the animatronics on the security monitors perfectly. I did love some of the YouTube cameos, but I wish they had more. Yeah, I wish they had more YouTuber cameos, like uh, Markiplier. And there were a few jump scares, just like in the games. And again, stay true to the lore from the original. And I loved every second of it. 
even though I won't be a security guard. <laughs> so yeah, that's my that that is my short review. I, I hope you appreciate my take. This is Mikey Mike, signing off. So yeah, that was his short little review of the movie. Okay, I'm recording the rest of the review uh, two days later. Let's just pretend I record this whole thing at once. Anyway, so now on to the spoiler section. Now, I'm not gonna, like, go over every single spoiler or anything like that. I'll just go over some of the more notable stuff. So first off, the cold open with the security guard who tries to escape Freddy's only to be killed instead. Like, there's some great tension throughout the sequence. We get some hints of the animatronics without fully revealing them yet. And we even get a bit of fan service when uh, Foxy, who initially is only shown by his shadow, is about to run up to the night guard and does the hum from the game. That was really cool. But yeah, it kind of sets the tone for what's to come, establishes what the threat is without fully revealing it, and is just overall, on its own, could be like a nice little short as well. And fun fact, that Night Guard was originally going to be played by Markiplier, but he was too busy doing the Iron Lung movie. I couldn't film his cameo as a result, so they just had me a random Night Guard instead. And then the next spoiler I'm going to talk about is Michael's motivation for getting hired at Freddy's. So first of all, we find out in the film that his brother Garrett was kidnapped when he was a kid. So he dreams every night of the day his brother went missing so that he can potentially remember details to help him find out who took Garrett. Also the book he has that kind of like tells him about this idea of finding memories through dreams is titled Dream 3 which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> And everyone else in the theater when I watched it thought it was hilarious too. <laughs> you know, this sets up a mystery of like, who took his brother, and also ends up pr providing a connection to uh, the uh, other missing kids when it turns out that the person who took him was the same person who killed those five kids. But yeah, so Mike gets fired from his current job, which is a security position in a day shift at a mall when he attacks a customer who he mistakenly thought was kidnapping a kid. Nope, the kid was the customer's own kid. Yeah, he kind of messed up there. But then a career counselor, Steve Raglan, offers him the Freddy's security gig, which he initially declines because it's a night shift with poor pay. But since he's in the middle of a custody battle with his aunt over for his uh, sister Abby, who is spending a lot of time drawing and communicating with imaginary friends who are later revealed to be the spirits of the missing kids. And so because he doesn't want to lose Abby, he decides to take the phrase position anyway. Now this whole entire backstory for Mike is not a thing in the games. And in fact, there isn't really a backstory given for Mike in the games. Unless you believe that Mike Schmidt is Mike Lafton, which I do. In the game continuity at least. But since that's never 100% confirmed, I think making this new backstory for Mike in the film is perfectly fine and does give him a reasonable understanding for why he would be desperate enough for a job at Freddy Fazbear's of all places. And, you know, it's, it works. It, it does its job of giving Mike a motivation. Now the first couple of nights go fine, save for him sleeping on the job. <laughs> Probably shouldn't be doing that when you got possessed animatronics who are capable of killing people pretty efficiently too as we see later on but he isn't at risk yet but on night two though he does meet an officer by the name of Vanessa who tells him about what happened at Freddy's and introduces him to the animatronics and overall I think these two nights are fine they don't go into the horror aspect yet and are mostly just kind of chill but to be fair in the games the earlier nights tend to be pretty relatively chill like there's still danger in the first two nights in like every game but well except for FNAF 3 and Sister Location but they're much easier compared to later nights. However between nights two and three Mike's aunt decides to uh, stage a uh, break-in at Freddy's to get Mike fired. And this is the break-in that we see in the second trailer where all the people involved get are basically given free epitaphs by the uh, animatronics. <laughs> So yeah, we see this break-in take place, and we see one person getting killed by the cupcake, another one gets killed by Foxy, Hank is killed by Bonnie, and then finally Max, who was Abby's babysitter during Nights 1-2, gets killed by Freddy, and was easily the coolest kill in the film, just because, like, the spirit of the child, like, reaches out of the animatronic, grabs her, then pulls her in to Freddy's mouth, and then Freddy chomps down and bites her in half. Like, I was not expecting that to happen. 
Like, I knew that the hand was going to reach out and grab her since it was showing the trailer, but I did not expect it to go that far in the film. Unfortunately, one that happened in my showing, nobody shouted, was that the bite of a selling? So I think that would have been a perfect opportunity for someone in the audience to say that. <laughs> but yeah, because the person babysitting Abby is now dead, chopped in half, or chomped in half technically, Mike needs to take Abby with him on night three. And, well, turns out the animatronics are friendly with her. Well, that's lucky. And uh, that's where it also turns out that the spirits were the friends Abby was communicating with. And so because of that, Mike brings Abby back on night four, where they find out that Vanessa also knew that the animatronics were possessed by the kids. And, well, night four I know is going to be the most controversial of the five nights in the film for some fans, because night four doesn't really have any horror moments. Instead, Mike, Abby, Vanessa, and the animatronics use the chairs and tables to build a fort. <laughs> I can understand why people may not like that scene, because it kind of does kill attention a bit, I guess. Since rather than being a horror sequence, it's instead this, like, sort of wholesome sequence of just the animatronics getting along with the humans. Like, I can understand why some people do have a problem with that scene. However, I personally like the scene. It's fun, it's a bit endearing, and it does help remind you that the spirits possessing these animatronics were kids. Just innocent kids who didn't do anything wrong before they died. Not to mention it does cause Mike and Abby to be lulled into a false sense of security with the animatronics before things go south the next time at 5. But Vanessa, meanwhile, ends up getting concerned and telling Mike not to bring Abby back. And so, for night 5, Abby ends up staying at home. And Mike actually starts going to Freddy's earlier, while still daylight. And throughout the film, every time he's fallen asleep at Freddy's, he's communicated with the spirits within his dreams. Because they know who it was who took Garrett, so he's trying to get them to tell him who it was. And then, on technically day five rather than night five, the kids give him an offer. Every night he can dream that Garrett was never taken as family was reunited, but in exchange, they want Abby, and he initially thinks they just mean like, oh, they want Abby to come over and play with them some more. Then he realizes that the kids actually mean to keep Abby instead, so he tries to fight back, but he gets injured and is nearly put into the death trap that the night guard from the cold open is killed in. But he manages to escape, and he is rescued by Vanessa, who helps him recover while dropping some big reveals about what happened at Freddy's. Big reveal number one, the kids' bodies were placed into the animatronics themselves, the one place that nobody thought to look, because it wouldn't make sense to look there in any normal circumstance. Number two, the killer was her father. William Afton, which is a big deviation from the games, because in the games, while well, Vanessa does get turned evil by Glitchtrap, who is a, like, digital recreation slash virus of William Afton, Vanessa in the games is not an Afton. But I'm fine with her being an Afton in the movies. Gives her a reason why she's around much earlier in the timeline compared to the games. It also, it also gives her an explanation for why she knows so much about Freddy's. And then number three, William Afton was the one who took Garrett, as shown when Vanessa shows Mike a picture of William Afton in the Spring Bonnie costume from the 80s with her as a child, and she's holding the toy plane that Garrett had when he was taken. Meanwhile, Golden Freddy shows up and takes Abby to the pizzeria, and Chica brings Abby to a room with a Springlock animatronic that Looks a lot like the Illidol from the Silver Eyes, and intends on putting her in it, but Mike and Vanessa return to the pizzeria, where Mike takes down Freddy and Bonnie by electrocuting them to temporarily disable them, and then does the same to Chica and rescues Abby. And then after that, they then have to survive a bit against the animatronics before William shows up wearing the Spring Bonnie costume, which is now worn down after about 15, 20 years or so. And then they end up fighting against Springtrap, only for Vanessa to be stabbed, and Abby grabs a poster from the wall and draws on the back of it to show the spirits who were being influenced by William at the time what William really did to them, prompting them to attack William for revenge. Where the cupcake lunges after William, bites off part of the spring body costume, and then sets off the spring locks, causing William to suffer a spring lock failure as he puts the mask of the Antron back on, which he had taken off earlier, and he says the line, I always come back. 
that was really cool when he said it. And then as he's suffering from the spring lock failure, the animatronics drag him to another part of the building, akin to what happened at the end of the Silver Eyes. And Mike and Abby escape, bringing an unconscious Vanessa with them. It was then put in the hospital in a scene that they straight up showed in one of the trailers. They put a scene from the very end of the film into the trailers and somehow got away with it. <laughs> Yeah, I think Night 5 is definitely the best night. It's got the most going on. It's pretty intense at times. We get some important information revealed, and we get to see Matthew Lord as William Afton in action, with the spring lock failure actually happening on screen. And that spring lock failure scene is so good. So yeah, that's it on the spoiler section. Now, two lightning rounds. Lightning round one, my favorite Easter eggs. Just saying, it, saying them fast. They are. The Balloon Boy cameo, the Dream Theory book, the Map Hat and Corey X Kinchin cameos, the extra animatronic costumes of Sparky the Dog, Shadow Freddy, and Ella, the Living Tombstones FNAF song playing in the end credits, the Puppets Music Box being heard in the end credits, the FNAF 2 minigame style letter spelling out in the end credits, William Afton saying, see on the flip side, William Afton saying, I always come back. Bunny Chicken and Foxy during the break-in sequence having kills that are correspond to locations that they are shown in in the games. Abby hiding from Foxy behind the arcade cabinets in the same way that Charlie does in the Silver Eyes. And finally, the FNAF 1 posters from the office being seen in the security office in the film. And then lightning round number two is just going to be what predictions I got right earlier this month. Since earlier this month I did a video of five animatronics who I predicted could appear in the movie and five human characters who I predicted could appear in the movie. All right, and this time I was just gonna be which ones I got right and which ones I got wrong. So first the animatronics. Bloom Boy got right. The Puppet got wrong. Fredbear got wrong. Unweathered Spring Bonnie got right. Circus Baby got wrong. Human characters. Henry got wrong. Charlie got wrong. Michael Laughing got wrong. Phone Guy got half wrong. William Afton kind of takes a phone guy as role in the movie. And finally, Scott Coughlin himself cameoing got wrong. So that concludes my review of the movie. Once again, let me know what you think in the comments, what you liked, disliked, agreed with in my review, disagreed with in my review, and whether or not you're looking forward to the sequels, since they're going to happen at this point. The FNAF movie franchise is always comes back. And yeah, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, dislike, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell in order to provide feedback and support me, and I'll be back next video. Have a great remainder of the FNAF Movie Month.